Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. Um, my name is David. I'm the co-founder of Coalition for Queens. Um, and thanks for coming to Queen's Tech Meetup. This is the second one that we've had in this space. So we're really excited to have everyone here in Queens. Um, our nonprofit, Coalition for Queens, we are committed to growing the tech community here. Uh, Queens is a population of 2.3 million people. It's the world's most diverse community. And we really believe that that's a great asset for, uh, for New York City. And we hope to create um, a model for a really inclusive community, a uh, really inclusive tech community. Um, Queen's Tech Meetup is one of the things that we do. Um, we host a lot of community building initiatives like this. Um, we also have an education program called Access Code. Um, we have some of our students here from last year, so we're really excited to have them. Um, and we're, um, so Access Code, it's a developer training program. Um, it's a nine month intensive comprehensive program where we train mobile developers. Um, we're hoping to launch uh, again in January. We're gonna open up applications this week. So if you're interested, if you know anyone who you think would be interested in the program, um, please check out our website. Um, the program is uh, intended to create uh, an inclusive community. So we are targeting um, individuals that um, you know, traditionally don't have access to um, this type of t uh, education. Um, so please check us out. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, yeah. And here is Aaron. Aaron is the MC um, of Queen's Tech Meetup. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave, for that introduction. And welcome, everybody, here tonight. Um, as Dave said, Queen's Tech Meetup is one of the many programs that Coalition for Queens puts on to support tech innovation and foster the tech community in, the, uh, in and around Queens and for the people in and around Queens. Um, we've got a, a ever-growing community of members of our meetup group. We surpassed 2,000 members earlier this summer. Um, first question, who here is uh, here for the first time, either to a meetup or to the space? Awesome. Uh, that's a trend that we see continuing on at every meetup here, more and more new people are joining uh, our community here and seeing what Queens has to offer. Um, obviously, New York is a hotbed of startup activity. Um, not everyone can afford the rents in Manhattan. And actually, there are some unique benefits to starting a company in Queens, moving your company to Queens, or just living in Queens and then working on your startup somewhere else in the city. And I think of the four companies we have demoing tonight, uh, they all represent something like you know, one of those things. Um, so we have a very uh, interesting rundown of demos. Instacart, obviously a big company, hugely well financed. Employ Toy, startup still sort of in the early stages. Uh, Fly, another startup, almost at a million downloads in the App Store. And then Kepco, which is a fairly interesting uh, company, uh, unique in our traditional lineup here. They're a hardware manufacturer, and, and soon they're going to be showing all of you what this stuff does. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Next slide, please, Dan. Everyone say hi to Dan, our co-chair of the Tech Events Committee. Hi, Dan. Um, so obviously, thank you to Covington & Burling. They're a law firm that supports all sorts of startup and tech and that kind of thing. Um, and of course, also to Verizon, our sustaining sponsor of the year. I believe we have a Verizon rep in the audience today. Everyone say hi to our Verizon rep. If you're interested in finding out how uh, Verizon's amazing 4G XLTE network can benefit you as an individual or you as a company, uh, I'm sure he would love to talk to you sometimes tonight. Uh, we also get support from Plaxol. They're one of the oldest companies in Queens as well, plastics manufacturer that goes way back. Uh, Softlayer, IBM company, also a great sponsor this year. And uh, finally, Shea CPA is an accounting uh, firm based in Queens that specializes in helping nonprofits like Coalition for Queens. Um, next slide. Do we have a next slide? What's the next slide? Uh, okay. Um, I don't know why that says Instacart. That should say Kepco. Um, so I'm going to introduce our first demoer. We'll get right to the demos here. Um, please hold your questions till a little bit later. We're going to basically do a rundown, demo, demo, then questions for the first two demoers, um, then demo, demo, and then questions for the last two demoers. 
Um, try to really whittle down your thought to something specific. Um, if you want to tweet or post about tonight, feel free to use hashtag Queenstech, hashtag C4Q, um, post, tweet your heart out. Um, yeah, so uh, without further ado, here is Mark Kupferberg, uh, who's uh, Executive Vice President uh, of Kepco Industries. Um, Kepco is a, uh, one of Queen's first startups. He's been around for 50 or more years. He's in fact a second generation entrepreneur. His father and uncle started the company. Uh, now he's uh, carrying the torch forward along with his son. So it's a three generation uh, Queen's company. They make some uh, very, very unique DC power devices. Um, and Mark is going to tell you all about what exactly this stuff does and how it relates to all of our lives on a daily basis. So, Mark, take it away. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, usually at these uh, meetups, you see young entrepreneurs who are starting up companies and you wonder, what is somebody who's running a 68-year-old company doing here? Well, uh, as Aaron said, we really are Queen's first tech, meet tech uh, startup. Uh, back in 1946, my father and his brothers came back from World War II. They were working on the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, and uh, they wanted to do something in tech, uh, but they were a little short of money. So they figured they better do something that didn't require too much capital and where there wasn't too much competition from big guys who were going to squash them. So they came up with this idea of teaching the new emerging field of electronics. So they came up with this board where you can clip components together, you can plug tubes in. You know, tubes are not what toothpaste comes in. There were these glass enclosed things that were the predecessors of transistors. And they just, so they, they realized that they needed a power supply to provide direct current, the DC, to run these experiments. And of course, what Con Ed gives us out of the wall is alternating current. Welcome back to high school physics, right? So um, they need a power supply. So my dad designed a power supply. And in my grandparents' basement in Flushing, they, uh, they built these and they built the power supplies. And one of my uncles, who was in charge of sales, went out to colleges and universities and went to sell these. And, he, and they sold very well. So they went back to my grandparents' basement. They built them. They shipped them. My uncle goes back and asks for more orders after a few months. They say, we really love your product. We want to buy more. But you don't have to send us the boards. All we want are the power supplies. So. Indeed, that's how Kepco became a power supply company. So much for education. <laughs> but the spirit of entrepreneurship and, and their spirit to, to really help people do things better is something that's ended up in Kepco's culture. That culture of innovation is something that's alive and well, and it's the main, mainstay of our current corporate culture. We're located in Flushing. So, um, let's uh, go back one, please. So, this is a, uh, a product that uh, was inspired by um, responding to customers' needs. Customers said they wanted fault-tolerant, hot-swappable power, and we created that. And, uh, and that's what we're going to uh, be showing you tonight. Um, so we want to show, next slide please. We want to show you one of our latest innovations. Uh, this is uh, taking that idea of fault tolerant power, which means that there's no single point of failure, and bringing that into the world of ethernet. Most of us, when we think about ethernet cables like this, what do we think comes across here? Data, right? This is just data, right? Well, it turns out, there are extra pieces of wire in here other than the two wires that transmit the data. So people got the idea that if you were to put power, typically anything from 5 to 60 volts, over one of these cables, 
that all of a sudden installing this becomes easier. So if you have a device like this display, which is actually an Android computer, right? there's no power cord. All right? There's just one Ethernet cable. You say, who cares? Well, if any of you have tried to get a permit to do electrical work in New York City, you'd understand why you care. Or if you tried to run some mobile event where, you didn't, where it was dangerous to run AC power around, running one of these Cat5 cables is a lot better. So um, this is one of these things that allows you to do things easier and faster. So what we're going to do is we're going to show you just how this works. We've got several power over Ethernet devices today. We have the display and we have a camera. And what we're going to do next is we're going to switch over to the camera. And you're actually going to see these power supplies, which are converting the AC from the wall into DC. It's going through a uh, power over Ethernet hub. So it basically it's taking the data from the computer. And, um, and what it's doing is allowing us then to connect all this up with no AC. Now say, who cares about this? Well, take this building and imagine you wanted to have entry devices that, that allowed you to control who went into a various, to the various rooms. Today, if you had to do that, for each door, you'd have to have an AC outlet. And most people, when they're doing this, are using what's called a power over Ethernet injector. This is Melissa. She's our local sales representative. And, and Wave, uh, Eric is, is one of our applications engineers. So they're helping tonight show, tell a story. So here we go. What you're actually looking at is, um, is a power over Ethernet camera. And both the data and the power are coming over that black Cat5 cable there. So if you're using one of those um, power over Ethernet injectors, what happens when the, when the plug comes out of the wall? Go ahead. That's what happens. You're out of business. So if you're running a camera, a security camera, if you're running an access control device, if you're running a Wi-Fi hotspot and you don't want these to go down, you need to do something different. So let's plug the, plug the PoE back in. And we're, and we're gonna, and we're gonna power that using, um, using our fault tolerant power supplies. And, um, this rack contains four of them, and you can put in this any, you can configure that anywhere from 50 watts to 450 watts in the, uh, and, and have fault tolerance. So let's take a look now at what this really means. So uh, let's get the camera back up and going first. This is the one fault, to non fault, this is, the computer is the one kind of not fault tolerant part of this system. So anyway, let's, let's start by turning one of the power supplies off. And let's pull it out of the rack. OK. So show that. <laughs> special, very special, right? And now what we'll do is we will remove one of the two power cords. Each, each pair of power supplies here are powered from a different uh, AC main. So what you can do is, uh, is so we've now had two failures, right? And, there's Mel and Melissa's still there up on the camera using the PoE with this one, with this one last one that's on. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and it slides back in too. 
You say, well, who, who could use something like this? Well, people who care about things running all the time. This is a, a variant of what's on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange that makes sure that those trades don't stop. They probably have the highest cost of downtime of anybody in the world, and they're pretty serious about staying up, and that's why they use a system like this, a bigger version of this. Okay, so, so that's our POE solution where we're putting both DC power and, uh, and data over the same cable. Uh, I do need to thank our friends at Comark who lent us this display. Um, these things are designed for access control and, and announcements like when you go to a conference and you, you wonder how does that thing get up on a, next to the door telling you what's going on in the room. That's how it gets there. And by using this, the installation is easy, the maintenance is easy, and it's a very cost-effective solution. So while this may cost a little bit more than buying one of these PoE injectors, the difference is, is that this is in one place. You can back it up with a battery. We, we supply a battery backup version of this, so it's like a DC uninterruptible power supply. And it's, it's very cool for actually making sure that things work when they're supposed to work. Um, these types of systems are used in oil refineries. They're used by the FAA in terms of air traffic control and all kinds of other cool things. But this is a, an application that anybody who's doing like a, uh, a fair or a concert can actually run their devices safely and inexpensively and easily using this kind of system. Okay. So what we want to show you next is um, something everybody knows. What kind of cable is this? USB. USB, that's right. You don't think about this. You just plug it in, right? Well, what's supposed to come over this in addition to your data is 5 volts DC, which is supposed to power your device, whether it's it's your, charging your iPhone or uh, running something, some other USB device. Our friend Jerry, he makes something that, that scans your uh, irises that runs over, over this. And, uh, and he makes a, another cool thing to uh, allow you to have these really strong passwords that you don't have to remember and that runs over USB. So. Uh, you got all of these different kinds of things. And you don't think about this. And most people who make these devices, they don't think about it either. Because what they end up doing is say, oh, that's fine. I'm just going to plug this into a USB hub. And say, well, what voltage do you get out of that? And you say, well, the spec says I'm supposed to get 5 volts. How do you know it gets 5 volts? You don't. And so to make sure that your device works properly, you need to test it at that 5 volts. You need to test it at the high range, which is 5.5 volts. And you need to test it at the low range at 4.5. And, and you also have to check out whether anything weird is going on with your device. And one of the indicators of that is how much power your device is is drawing. And our power supply here is programmable. Normally we would do this over the computer, but the cord isn't quite long enough. And um, what we're going to do is we'll just take a picture of this and Eric's going to come up and just dim, just reduce the voltage and increase the voltage to dim and, uh, and brighten the light. Um, this is kind of a trivial display, but it gives you a sense of this because if you're sitting in the dentist's office and they stick one of those uh, um, replacements for x-ray film in your mouth, typically those things are powered by USB. Well, guess what? If somebody in the dentist's office says, my computer is too far away, I'm gonna plug in an extension cord and you go beyond you know, the the standard length, 
that voltage over that cable tends to drop off. And guess what? When they're zapping you with x-rays, you don't want that to fail. You don't want it to misbehave. And so you want to make sure that that device works not just under normal conditions, but under some abnormal conditions. And that's, and, but how do you know that if all you do is just plug it into the USB port? You don't. That's why you need a programmable power supply to raise the voltage, to lower the voltage, and record what's going on in terms of the amount of current, how many amps are going into the device that's being tested. So these are examples of how power supplies can actually help us live daily better and make the things that we run work better. So um, so you know, this is what a company that's responsive to their customers really does. They focus on uh, what's important to the customer. Our customers tell us this stuff is important, so we developed it, and, and then we sell it to other people. Most of what we make are standard products. We also customize some of them. Um, so uh, you can check out our solutions on our website, kepcopower.com. And uh, the one thing I want to leave you with is this, um, is that we really power innovations. You don't think much when you walk past these call boxes every day. But back in 1968, when the fire department came to KEPCO and said, we really want to do more than just pull a handle. We want to be able to talk to people so we understand what resources to send out, whether it's the police or the fire department, what kind of units should we send out. And they said, we want to talk to people who are pulling the box. There's just one little problem. The original boxes had, were based on te telegraph technology. So they came to us and said, if you just had a power supply that did this, we could use the telegraph wires to tr transmit voice and data. So KEPCO designed a power supply, built it. 1969, they installed these all over the country, all over the city. We put them in other cities as well. And for the next 32 years, KEPCO maintained those power supplies. We repaired them. We upgraded them. And then 9-11 comes around. 17 seconds after the first impact, Manhattan Dispatch had the, had the alarm, transmitted through that 32-year-old KEPCO power system. And the fire department told us that they credit that fast alarm with being able to dispatch rapidly and get so many people out of the, uh, of the trade centers alive. So after that, we, uh, we created a second generation system, which is in place right now and which is helping to keep us all safe every day. And you know, this is where powering innovation really makes a difference in people's lives every day. And we're very proud that we were able to help so many people with our systems. And we continue to do that in all kinds of different ways. So we thank you very much for coming to hear our story tonight. And I look forward to answering your questions during the Q&A period. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm going to move on to our next demo in a second. Um, Dan, if you want to get the Chromecast back up. Uh, and I believe we will be moving along shortly. Um, I guess I'll just hold this for now. Um, our next demoer is uh, Jerry Gramont. Um, he lives in Queens, uh, runs his startup somewhere else in the city that we won't mention, but nonetheless <laughs> lives in Queens. Um, and uh, he's here to tell you all about Employ Toy, a company he founded with his wife, who will be driving uh, this uh, uh, presentation for you today. Um, so take it away, Jerry. Tell us all about Employ Toy. Cool. Hi, 
Um, I'm Jerry. I am the founder of Employ Toy, and my wife, Erica, co-founder. Thank you. Um, see, a couple of years back, I, I used to help a lot of companies essentially recruit for their businesses. But, you know, even before that, I was also in the chair of trying to figure out what is the best way of finding jobs. You know, you come out of college, you're not sure exactly where to look. Sometimes you go to an interview and they say, well, you don't have enough experience. I'm sure everybody has been through that. Um, what do you do? And that bothered us for quite some time. Um, fortunately, she actually joined a recruiting agency and she was, she's been working in HR um, for the past 10 years. Um, and me, I was just literally recruiting for startups, constantly building new teams. And we found something out. So we said, you know what, let's start off by telling people exactly about you know, hiring jobs. Let's give some better information about that. So we said, you know what, let's start a Facebook page. We started right here, actually on Facebook, created our brand, and we said, let's share our knowledge with everybody online. From there, we acquired quite a few customers, and we decided, wow, this is pretty cool. Let's venture off to um, Twitter. You know, Twitter is a hot new program platform now to talk to people. Let's use Twitter as a platform to essentially um, dis dissipate our information, which we did. We started essentially sharing information on Twitter um, about jobs and how to find jobs and great resources on you know how to interview properly and what kind of questions you should ask for the employer to the employer and of course we made it fun too job searching is such a stressful time so we wanted to make sure it was fun as well nobody likes to read articles that's really boring so we said all right let's make it fun let's make it really nice and open with everybody um, recently however we said wow we need to expand let's build a site but before we even built a site we actually started off with our Instagram account. Um, we started sharing essentially information on Instagram. We started sharing all types of stuff. In fact, after we built the site, we started sharing also jobs that we had available. We started sharing also the team that we built um, for Employee Toy. And we started getting lots of notice. Anytime, by the way, that we would have a demo, like today, we would share it also. Uh, we started getting lots of notice, a lot of people. Um, and finally, we said, okay, great, let's start putting some jobs up. Let's start connecting with employers and people. So we built this platform essentially that uses data science to help employers and job seekers make smarter decisions. That's really important. If you knew exactly um, what kind of company you should be working for, at least an, an insight on why you should be working for a specific company, that's what we built. So we said, you know what, how do we find people in the right places? So I opened up my marketing head and said, all right, let's think about exactly what should we do. We started posting jobs on websites like Indeed. Um, we said, let's use different platforms to help drive customers to our site. And from there, we'll educate them. Let's not waste our time on marketing and advertising because people really don't understand this whole data stuff anyways. So we started creating real jobs. Um, posting them on Indeed, reposting them on Indeed, and direct all the traffic, if you could see the highlight down there, direct all the traffic back to our website to allow users to apply. Once users would then go back to our website, they would be presented essentially with a similar ad as well as the job that they saw. The only difference is they would actually see some key, key skill words. Um, skills are important, you know, this is what we use as far as hard skills to help us figure out what we're good at, right? Um, but a lot of jobs actually require not just hard skills, they require soft skills. Um, sometimes we have these skills, but they're not actually part of our resume. They're part of our just regular life, you know, I'm sure tons of you, even for me, for example, I didn't know that I was going to be great at user experience. It wasn't until my mentor plucked me out of um, fashion merchandising school and said, you are great at really directing customers on how to do things. So he said, I want you to come to work for me in my startup in New York City and help me essentially put websites together. And I want you to think about how users flow through that website. At the time, it was information architecture. 
Today we call it user experience. Tomorrow's going to be something else. But the main point is I did not know that I had that skill through fashion merchandising. And that's what we built, a tool to understand essentially your experience, your education, and also some social data that you already share online to help you find relevant jobs, to help you make smarter decisions when looking for a job. So when somebody comes to this website, the next step that they do is, oh, great, I have these skills. Let me go ahead and sign up to apply. As you're signing up, if you have a LinkedIn account, you can go ahead and sign up through LinkedIn. We'll do that you know, just to make things go a little faster. So I already created an account. Um, if you don't have an account, you actually won't see this. Once you create an account and everything is up there, our data science actually automatically starts pulling in jobs from all of, in, onto our platform and starts populating into this feed. This feed is actually going to be populated with a lot more than just jobs. It's going to be populated with events that you should be going to, just like today, actually. Every single event that you go to, you actually might learn something new or meet somebody that's important that you want to talk to and uh, hopefully get a job through them, right? So we'll have events also. And also through your feed, you'll be able to see friends that you have that you'll be able to refer to other jobs. So it's really a nice little ecosystem that you can really manage your entire process and not worry about you know, going through thousands of websites. So let's check out the profile, actually, and how to create your feed properly. So uh, when we created the profile, we wanted something, you know, every website started doing it also, but we didn't create this, un unfortunately. Um, but we said, wow, that's a great thing, you know, to have a leader image to kind of like lead people and in, in understanding who you are and what you do. Pictures can say a thousand words, so why not lead with that, right? So that's what we did. We create a leading image to allow people to say exactly who they are, what they do, and to kind of really differentiate themselves out there. If you start scrolling down, you'll start realizing, actually, your jobs are your timeline. They're part of your timeline. You'll see things that you've had either in the past as you know, late as possible, and things all the way at the top, you know, newer jobs at the top. You can click on them, actually, to display the skills that you've had for that particular experience um, and the details for that particular job. Let's say you wanted to edit this. You can actually just click on that January um, word and edit this experience. Maybe you want to add some skills that you've had um, for this particular experience. Each skill actually boosts up your profile. And the reason why is because if you had, let's say, um, a skill added to this position, it'll help us understand how much experience you've actually had at this particular experience as a CTO. Um, so as many skills that you have that you can remember, you can add them and it'll actually start populating more jobs into your um, feed. If you scroll up a little bit. Let's say you wanted to add it to a new experience. You can also click a new experience, just like any other website, essentially. What we want you to do is really keep the process as simple and as familiar as possible that you guys are used to, essentially. We didn't want to create anything new that you weren't familiar with, because already this is doing something huge, right? You don't have to search. I hate searching. I want something to tell me and direct me why I should go to specific jobs. That's why we use recruiters, right? But a lot of times we know that recruiters actually just tend to place people just to place and actually don't help people that actually really need the help. So we created this tool essentially to really do that. Um, at this point right now, we're brand new. We launched in June. Um, since June, we've done 1,898 job matches, which is awesome. We're really happy about that. We have over 100 employers sign up onto the website. We have over 1,000 users um, visiting us and signed up also. So if you guys are looking for a job, if you guys are looking to hire or recruit anybody, please let us know. We'll be glad to help you out. This is our presentation. So thank you very much, Jerry. Great presentation. Who here has a question for either uh, Employee Toy or Capco? In the back. Yeah, question for Employee Toy. Can you export your LinkedIn profile into? Yes. 
Yes. So the question is, can you export your LinkedIn profile into your employee toy profile? Yes. Okay. So that was one of the most important things, right? A lot of people have LinkedIn profiles, and we wanted to make sure that you know they can ex you know import any type of data essentially into our platform. Currently, we are working on exporting your resume as easy as taking a picture. Um, that requires a lot more uh, data science in the imaging side, um, but we're actually getting pretty close. Um, but yes, you can ex import your LinkedIn profile and add more information also to it. Great. Um, any other questions for either of our first two demoers? In the back again. So you facilitate discovery of possible employers for uh, a job seeker? Yes. And so do you facilitate follow through through the connection? Like how do you how do you facilitate the follow through? Sure, sure. Let me repeat the question. So the question is, how do you facilitate the follow through between the connection, follow up or the follow up and the connection between the employer and the employer? Great question. Um, essentially, after applying for a job, one of the things that we hated was you felt like your resume went into a black abyss. You never knew exactly what happened. So we actually added triggers to where if we realize the employer kind of like browsed through your resume and never really looked at it again. We notify our users that, hey, by the way, it seems like this employer is moving on. They've been interviewed with quite a few other people. Um, if you're waiting for this job, I think you should move on. So we created that email, essentially, just to inform our users. One of the things that we do, however, is let's say an employer didn't want to interview with you. Um, we introduce a better way of, you know, I guess, paying for all of this. Um, every single time that we check other websites, we found out that employers were paying actually to just post a listing, which really sucks because you don't know what you're going to get back. Um, so we said, you know what, instead of paying for a listing, why don't you pay for an interview? So we introduced essentially pay to interview for employers. After an employer is able to view your profile and deem that you're a great match after our algorithm has informed them of that, um, they can pay $24.95 to interview, essentially. And let's say you decline, the employer doesn't have to worry about losing their money, they can use that money actually towards another interview. So Right. Um, actually, yeah. No, no so you're 100% you're correct. The, the question is, are you catering more to the employers, or are you catering to more to the potential employee? Correct. Um, I don't want to say either or. And the reason why is because we wanted to facilitate the process. It's the process that was completely broken. That's what we felt, at least. Um, most people essentially just tend to go online and search through every single job website, which doesn't help you because you wind up just wasting time you know, trying to find a job. So we've included ways where, uh, which we'll be launching soon in our app, where as you're maybe at an event, you want to meet the right people. As you're maybe in a new city, you want to know, hey, I would love to work over here, who's hiring for me, right? We're releasing those type of features in our mobile app, essentially. So it's really about facilitating the process. Everything else that came with it was just something that was a plus for us. Sure. Um, does anyone have a question for Kefco before we go on? How about Jolly? A question for Kefco? About the fire things. I read, you know, the, the stations that, I, I, you know, they're kind of rotting in the ground slightly. They're not as functional as they once were. You know, there was recently a thing where they tried to repurpose phone things, and I read the reason they can't do something similar with the fire is that there's fire, there's special union restrictions on who can wire those things. And the, you know, do you see any future for like, you know, doing something like enabling them so that people can, you know, instantly connect with them from their phones or some kind of useful thing that can be so made with those? I, I think the question is. Do you have any insights into maybe some political considerations that go into deploying these networks, or how can we maybe take this concept to the next level and integrate it into mobile and, and all that jazz? The, the politics of this is way over my pay grade. <laughs> so <laughs> Good answer. Let, let me leave that piece of this aside. Um, and I'll do the same for the union work rules. <laughs> what I should tell you is, is that the new system 
that we deployed a few years ago is capable of data transmission as well as voice. So the idea is, is that you could have other portals that would be able to connect to it, whether it's a fireman who plugs in a laptop or a tablet to get live data when they're fighting a fire in a particular building. That technology is certainly potentially open to other forms of access, for example, using cell phones or tablets. Um, the reason that this system continues, even though lots of people have tried to kill it over the years, and they say, well, everybody's got cell phones. Why do I need these things anymore? The answer is, in the face of a disaster, those cell systems are vastly overloaded. This is a dedicated network which provides that emergency communication when everything else has failed. In fact, the reason that this system worked on 9-11 was it was a hardwired system that went down into the ground. The primary system, which was wireless, went up to the uh, antennas on the roof, yep. and when the plane hit, that was decapitated. So in spite of all of the crazy things that were going on, this system worked. And uh, that's why we believe it has a future, and the FDNY really believes in, in continuing to have this baseline technology in place. That doesn't mean it's easy, right? These, many of these wires are now over 100 years old. They t the insulation is breaking down. There are all kinds of weird things that go on. In fact, part of the reason that they upgraded to the new power supplies is because to deal with things like shorts and ground loops and other things, they needed more capability in the power supplies than their original system that was deployed in the 60s. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's not obvious why this is important but it is absolutely extensible. Uh, it's more a matter of political will than technology. Got it. Okay, we got quite time for one more question. Andrew in the back. Is this from our, uh, you said early in the days before you get the switchboard, you decided to build the power supply because the customer asked you. First question is, at that time, were you cash flow positive? And if you weren't, uh, what was the thought process behind making that decision based on launching that product and possibly scale up the So Andrew's question has to do, I think, with at what point did Kepco as a business become sustainable? Was that contract that you were awarded sort of like the break-even point, or was it a big milestone for your company? How did it influence your, your business from there? Um, the, the fire department job, uh, you know, we were really a mature company at that point. Um, it was, they helped finance that thing because it was a truly special, unique product. And uh, so uh, we collaborated on that. And, uh, and back in the 60s, we got some money from the fire department to help us design the product. One of the things that we've learned is that if somebody wants something special, uh, the way to differentiate whether or not they're serious is to ask them for some money. <laughs> Don't be shy. You've got to ask for money. Yeah. If you have something that somebody wants, they will pay for it. If they won't write you a check, they're not serious. You know, remember your first economics class where they taught you the difference between economic demand and desire? You know, I want, I desire that Rolls Royce, but I demand a Chevy because I have the money to buy a Chevy, not the money to buy a Rolls Royce. And in terms of figuring out what to do, um, you know, if somebody wants something special, they're going to pay for it. Uh, does that answer the question? I have a good follow-up to that. Google, should I work for free? There's a great flow chart. It's the first one. I think it's should I work for free.com. Usually the answer is no. So, uh, anyway, thank you, everybody. Let's give our first demo a round of applause. So we have two more demos in store for you tonight. Um, our next demoer, uh, full disclosure, is one of my best friends in the tech community. Uh, used to work for the man, 
way back when, uh, a little more than two years ago, we, the two of us demoed the prototype of the product you're about to see uh, on the big stage at New York Tech Meetup. Uh, I guess the very, very, very big brother of Quinn, Queen's Tech Meetup. Um, and it's uh, been an incredible honor to work with the guy over here. His name is Tim, Dr. Tim Novikoff. Um, he's about as genuine of a New York startup guy as you can get. Uh, he used to teach at Stuyvesant High School in New York City. Uh, he went to NYU for undergrad. He went to City College for a master's degree. He went to Cornell for a PhD. Uh, he's also been extremely active with Coalition for Queens. He helped out with our pilot access code development program. Uh, he actually went on to hire one of the graduates of the access code program. Um, so he is a uh, very near and dear to my heart. He's very near and dear to Coalition for Queens heart. Um, and I'm very, very proud to introduce Dr. Tim Novikoff, who's here to tell you all about why. <laughs> I feel like I don't need to demo anything. That was, the, <laughs> that was the best intro I've ever had in my life. I think I can <laughs> just wrap up now. Thank you. Um, yeah, so a few years ago when I was in grad school, I started this company uh, to make a video editing app. Try to make uh, an app that brings the, the medium of video creation uh, into the mainstream so that anybody can do it. It's really, really simple. You don't need uh, video editing skills. Uh, and now it's out. It launched this summer. Um, it has about a million downloads, and it was uh, featured as number one under best new apps. Uh, and so here's how it works. We're going to create a video at the top there. Uh, on the bottom, there are four component videos that I recorded. And I'm just going to cut in between them to make the, the final video, which you can see up top being created in real time. And I'm going to do it to some music, which I've already chosen. So uh, the way this works is you just uh, tap to cut to camera one, tap to cut to camera two. Tap, tap, tap. Just every time you tap, it switches. And then you can play it again, and it plays right away, no render time. So it's a very, very fast way to create a video. Uh, it's inspired by. <laughs> It's inspired by you know, the way a TV producer would edit live television saying, cut to camera three, cut to camera four. But in, in this case, the cameras are all just your iPhone. And they're, uh, they're actually just videos that you shot before editing. Um, and there are some cool features that you can do uh, with a multi-touch screen. So here I'm going to show you one of my favorite features, which is swipe to dissolve. So instead of tap to cut to camera two, I'm going to swipe to camera two, and it'll do a dissolve transition. Check it out. Swipe. Swipe, swipe, and the longer the swipe, the longer the dissolve transition. So it, uh, it allows you to actually play around with different transitions. And if you tap with two fingers like this, like uh, Peace Sign or Richard Nixon, uh, it, uh, it will do a split screen. So. And you can play around with, you know, single. Dissolve, split screen, or you can do picture in picture. Uh, so it's all very, very fast, and you never have to wait. It just plays back right away. So uh, that's, uh, that's the main feature in Flies. It allows you to edit videos very, very quickly. Uh, Fly is free on the App Store. It has in-app purchases. Uh, but for everybody who's here tonight, please see Emily Park over there. Wave. Uh, she will arrange for you to get all the in-app purchases uh, for free. It's normally $16, but using a Queens Tech Meetup uh, code, you guys can all get it uh, for free. Um, I'm, I'm a really bad CEO. I can't look someone in the eyes and then <laughs> can't look someone in the eyes and then like take any of their money. So you guys all just get everything for free, right? <laughs> um, and uh, it's only for iPhone, yeah, so far. Does it come? <laughs> that's that's actually that's actually a good question. Does it come with an iPhone? Because it does not come with an iPhone. But uh, something interesting is going to happen in the future, which is that if you go to an Apple store, and um, 
you look at the demo devices in the store, it actually will be built onto the demo devices. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's, well, it's not sure, you know, they've requested it, uh, a special build for the uh, retail stores, and I hope that happens. It's pretty crazy because, you know, Apple makes like 70% of their money from selling iPhones, and, you know, they put all their commercials and their ads, and they'll have a whole sales funnel to get somebody to buy an iPhone at the very last minute, you know, there's somebody in the store like physically holding the device deciding whether or not they want to buy it. And at that moment, they want fly on that device. That's like actually uh, pretty crazy, <laughs> pretty crazy that they would do that. So, well, we'll take it. Um, but otherwise, it does not come on an iPhone. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, there's actually other ways you can create videos uh, within Fly. Fly is an app that allows you to edit videos very quickly and easily with no training. Just tap to cut to camera two, cut to camera three. So uh, you know you can do it very quickly. Um, but you can also uh, do some more uh, complex things with Fly if you kind of find yourself getting into video. So there's this other feature called the Clips Editor in Fly. Uh, which allows you to uh, pick videos. Here, I'm picking videos that I actually took at the New York Tech Meetup. I'll, I'll pick a song. Oh, hello, Aaron Cohen. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and here, it, it takes a bunch of clips that I just chose from the uh, photo library, and now I can trim all of them, uh, and if I want, I can rearrange them also, uh, and then allows me to play them one after another. So that's another really, really fast way of editing uh, videos in Fly. Totally different, but uh, another separate way of editing videos in Fly uh, called the Clips Editor. Um, and in two days, we're finally launching our second app. Uh, our s it took three years to put out our first app. <laughs> uh, but it, it's only taking a couple of months to uh, put out our second one. Uh, this one's coming out on Thursday. Here's a sneak peek at it. Nobody's seen this yet. It's the first, uh, first demo of it. Uh, and here I've taken some footage uh, with this dude earlier. <laughs> uh, <and laughs> don't worry, it's cool. <laughs> um, and, you know, but I did something stupid that people often do, which that guy's doing right now. He's recording me uh, with his phone like this. See, he's doing like portrait video. You guys know how that looks in YouTube, right? It's like vertical video syndrome where it's going to be like this tiny little video and then just like black space on the sides. You gotta hold your video like that, phone like that when you record. Oh, then it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> then it's cool. Then it's cool. I should have known better, <laughs> Dave. Uh, um, but a lot, a lot of people record these videos, and it's always annoying because it looks like crap on YouTube. It looks just amateur. And so we created this tool called Crop on the Fly, which allows you to salvage your vertical videos. Uh, and the way it works is you play your video and then you crop it, crop a piece that's just gonna be perfectly shaped for YouTube or for a Facebook player, but allows you to crop on the fly so you can always get the most important part of the video. So here, let's see. We're gonna start with his face. And I get the beer. Make sure to track him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's so tall. <laughs> and so that allows you to crop the video so you've always got the best part. So now it's just playing back. Uh, and then you've got your final video. And this video is actually going to look great on a YouTube player. You can, you can see it like this, but it, it'll just look sideways up there. But now it looks great on an iPhone. It's actually iPhone shaped, 16 by 9. So that's, uh, that's crop on the fly. And uh, that's going to be free. Uh, no ads, no in-app purchases, uh, no reason to see anybody about that one. That one's just going to be free. <laughs> so uh, that's crop on the fly. Uh, earlier was fly. And we are Fly Labs. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so 
Ooh, multi-cam. You want to do that right now? We can do it right now. You want to do it right now? Let's do it, yeah. Um, all right. Come, come over. Come closer to me. Come closer to me. Okay. I'm on the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to turn it on. Right. This is probably the coolest camera I've ever seen. This was the original feature that we want, that anyone ever want, was let's, see, let's sync up multiple devices so that I don't have to get you to email me your video and then I have to sync it in Adobe Premiere or iMovie. Let's just get everyone recording simultaneously. So come, come right up to me here. Right so that, that way we'll be able to prove that it's really syncing, I hope. Uh, let's see, are you, did you turn Multicam on? Yes, I did. All right. On. I saw you saw me, but I can't see you. Are you on Wi-Fi and I, and I don't have uh, reception? Oh, Emily, Emily. Oh, you see Emily. All right, yeah, do you want to... I see Emily over there. Oh, I, well, I know what's going on. I'm on the staging version. Hold on. Let me put this on production. Uh, let's see. A little bonus demo for you. So I'll, I'll, in, so I'll invite you. You can see what's happening. I see Aaron and Emily. Uh, I'll invite both of them. Watch this. I know. He's got an invite. So I'm going to accept. Now I'm going to rotate. All right, and now now record me. So let's uh, let's see. Uh, switch to front-facing camera. Oh, gotcha. Or don't actually do either way. Yeah. Yeah. Do back-facing camera, but just point it towards me. So that gotcha. way there'll be like multiple angles of the same well, thing. They can't see it. Then. Uh, they can. See, they'll, they'll see it after, don't worry. Oh, gotcha. yeah, yeah. Okay, good point. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, but record record my face so that way oh, yeah, there's yeah, like yeah. two yeah. angles of the same thing. Uh, or do your face either way. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna hit. You can see there's three dots up there. When I hit record. Uh, they all start recording simultaneously. Uh, and now it's going to uh, record. Camera two, <coughs> camera one, camera three over there. That one, uh, we'll see if that one sticks up. And uh, when I hit stop, they all stop. So this could have been on tripods. Uh, they're not act actively doing anything. Uh, and now he <coughs> uploads his video. Um, you see it's on his screen. Um, I'll upload mine as well. Emily, are you uploading yours? There you go. All right, so I'm going to download. Aaron's video. I've got a really slow connection. Um, You're not on Verizon's XLTE. <laughs> uh, I'm, on, I'm on Verizon LTE. Um, <laughs> what's happening, man? <laughs> uh, it's better than Time Warner Cable. I will say that. <laughs> um, so I'm downloading Aaron's. So we'll, we'll wait uh, to download Aaron's. And so what's happening is, is once it downloads, it's going to synchronize them uh, using timestamps that were added to the videos. And then we're going to actually be able to edit literally cutting to camera one, cutting to camera two, where they're actually different cameras. So the, the, the way this whole app came about is it started with a desire to make a multi-angle uh, video app that allowed you to make multi-angle videos very quickly. And then what I found was it was just kind of more fun to do like the whole cut to camera three, cut to camera four thing. And I didn't want to bother with having to actually do multiple angles. It was just the activity of feeling like I was editing on the fly that, uh, that I liked. So we made it a single device app. But now it actually works. So we'll go with just uh, two videos here. Uh, they all start recording simultaneously. Uh, and now I'm just going to uh, record camera two, camera one, camera three over there. That one, uh, we'll see if it's not picked up. And uh, when I hit stop, so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Sam. I need that microphone back. All right. We've got one more demo for all you guys. Um, Instacart is a very big company. They raised a giant pile of money over the summer, north of $40 million. Um, they're tackling an issue that a lot of people in New York have, which is, you know, you go to Trader Joe's, you go to Whole Foods, you go to Costco, you know, what happens at the end? There's a line wrapping literally all the way around the building. Um, how can we completely just erase that whole experience from our lives? The answer is the Instacart experience. Um, I used it for the first time this past weekend. I wanted to make sure I wasn't presenting you a product that wasn't worth using. Um, and I can promise you it does what it says. On Sunday afternoon, the busiest time to go to a supermarket, um, I was able to order 50, 60 bucks of groceries from Whole Foods, and they showed up at my door two hours later. Um, and so now Will, the city manager for New York, is gonna tell you all about their recent expansion to Queens. 
um, and how anyone here who's a Queens resident or a Brooklyn <laughs> resident or a Manhattan resident um, can use Instacart to get their favorite groceries um, on demand. Take it away, Will. Thank you. So I kind of missed the memo on the demo aspect. Um, so this is a little bit more about the, the logistics of how we operate in New York, which I think you'll find pretty interesting. Um, you know, I thought about doing a demo, but then I realized, well, the, the, the idea of this product is that it's so easy to use. You can do it on your iPhone, your iPad, on the web. You can order your groceries, and they just show up at the door. I figured I want to tell you about the magic that happens between when you place the order and when it shows up at your door and sort of how we're tackling that same-day delivery problem here in New York. So, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, this is a bit about Instacart. So we launched in San Francisco in 2012, which makes us about two years old. Um, we've now been in New York since April, which makes us about seven months old here in New York. Um, we are in 16 major US cities, basically the biggest 16 cities in, in, in the country. Uh, as far as why people choose us, well, you know, I think especially here in New York, you have any number of options. You've got your corner bodega, you've got you know, your Whole Foods that does home delivery, you've got Fresh Direct, a number of other ways to get food on demand really quickly. So we have a couple things that set us apart. Uh, the first thing is the convenience factor. So we do same day delivery, we do same hour delivery, and we also do one hour window. So if I'm gonna be home from work, 6 to 7 p.m., I can place an order for that one hour window and know that it's actually gonna be um, waiting for me at my door between that one hour window. Uh, two is that we shop from the stores that you already know and love. So we shop from Whole Foods, we shop from Fairway, we shop from Costco, Key Food, and Food Emporium here in New York. So our customers are already familiar with those stores. There's no sort of learning curve for learning new inventory, um, unfamiliar products. These are already very familiar products. We've sort of crossed that first barrier. And lastly, it's our team of personal shoppers. So we have a very well-trained um, team of, of, of independent contractors who, who are shoppers, and they actually go out and shop for your order. We provide excellent customer service, and they're trained on, on picking the right items, whether it's produce, cereal, et cetera, and also providing a really great experience. So that's why people come back. Um, so with that in mind, uh, this is what New, York's, New York looks like at the moment. We cover virtually all of Manhattan, all the way down to, to Wall Street, and all the way up to 126th. We are in Queens and Brooklyn. So Queens, because we're in Queens, I'll touch on that a little bit more. Queens is our newest zone. We launched in uh, August of this year, and we currently shop from Key Food and Costco here in Queens. Um, we're always expanding, we're always adding more stores, so we hope to add uh, more offerings in Queens soon, and we'll be excited to do that and to have you guys try us out. Um, uh, well, hopefully before we do that, but, but I, especially after we do that as well. Cool. So. Um, a bit about logistics. So there's a really great documentary on YouTube about a company called Cosmo. That was sort of one of the first uh, same-day delivery services here in New York. Um, and I won't get into the history of it, but basically they tried to, to build this really big same-day delivery infrastructure here in New York. And there's a really great, great quote from that, from that video. And it's that the home market, or sorry, new markets do not perform like the home market. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. So our home market is San Francisco. That's sort of our Petri dish, and that's where we um, uh, you know, started two years ago and have had a lot of success. We've since, since launched in 16 other cities, New York being the sixth. And what we found is that it's not the same playbook every time, right? It's not partner with the grocery stores, hire a bunch of, of shoppers, um, and, and launch in that city. It's very nuanced and it's very different city by city. So I wanted to talk about uh, sort of some of the unique logistical challenges we face in New York and how we're tackling those. Um, so what does logistics mean? Well, for us, it's a couple things. One, it's timeliness, right? So we have to make sure that when we have an order, when we, when we take an order, that we can fulfill it in the time frame that we promised to. Two, it's efficiency. So that means that for our, our shopper fleet who's on, uh, who's on working on any given day, what's the utilization, right? Are we, are we paying people just to be idle at the store or are we paying people to actually make those deliveries and, and utilizing our fleet as best we can? And lastly, it's availability. So that means that's kind of a balance between efficiency and um, availability to make sure that you as the customer can place an order whenever you want, whether it's you know, within an hour or later this evening for 6 to 7 p.m., and we can fulfill that. Uh, so having people available while maximizing that efficiency. And that leads to happiness, right? So that's my sanity, that's my, my team's sanity, that's our shopper's sanity because we keep them full up with orders so, they, so they're paid well. And most importantly, it's, it's customer happiness, right? Um, so that means that orders are on time, fulfilled, uh, and delivered correctly. 
Cool. So in a perfect world, how do we do that? Well, it would just be one big truck. We put all the orders in there. We do 10 at a time and we just go uh, house to house to house to house to house to house and we deliver all those orders. But in reality, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, you know, Manhattan has this beautiful grid, this beautiful urban grid, right? You should be able to go down the streets and up the avenues and deliver your orders. But we all know that doesn't happen, right? We have traffic, we have uh, road closures, we had the marathon on Sunday. So there's all these obstacles that, that you know, that, that happen in every city, but especially in New York, there's so much more pronounced here just because of the population density um, and because of a number of other things going on. So how do we tackle those things? A um, couple of challenges, right? So the first thing is if you have a car, if you're a car owner and you live in New York, you are kind of the bell of the ball right now. You have a lot of companies who want to go after you and want your labor. So if you, you, know, if you go on Craigslist and you say, hey, I want a job as a part-time driver for a delivery service, you've got Lyft, you've got Uber, you've got uh, Postmates, you've got One One, you've got a lot of different people. So there's a lot of companies that are going after the very same pool of labor. So that's the first challenge for us. The second challenge for us is this, right? So this is a real tweet from a shopper and one of our Instacart shoppers is really psyched that he has a 57 item order. So we, do, we, we pay on a commission basis. So he's really excited that he got a big order and this was a very profitable order. That's fantastic. This shopper has a car. He probably doesn't know I'm stalking him on Twitter, um, but he has a car. But, but that's not the case, right? So as, as I just mentioned, there's a lot of competition for drivers in New York. So we can't get all the drivers we need and we also can't have all of our drivers go to the Whole Foods, park their car you know, in Midtown, shop for your order, come back an hour later um, and deliver it to your home right? because the car would be towed. So we have all these challenges. So this is what it actually looks like. right? So instead of being that nice big truck with all the orders that we deliver from point A to point B to point C, it's actually a sort of a, a hybrid model. right? So for us, what we found works really well is a hybrid model of drivers, bikers, and walkers. So when we get an order from you, we look at what the distance is from our store to your home, uh, what the, the delivery time is, so how fast we need to get it there, and how many orders are in that item. So based on those parameters, we can look at your order and say, hey, is this best for a driver, maybe a biker, or maybe someone who's on foot? So that's very different than what we've seen in any of our other markets. So we are the only market on uh, New York that has those three uh, delivery types, right? And that goes back to my point of, hey, you know, new markets do not perform like the home market and you have to adapt. So here what we've done is we've taken this really different hybrid model that didn't work, you know, that wasn't done in any other city, applied it to New York, and we found that this actually works really well for us. Um, and then sort of, you know, this is sort of the next level uh, logistics. So we partnered with Whole Foods, Fairway, a number of other stores, and we now have uh, uh, refrigerators, uh, shelves, freezers stationed in those stores. So now what we're doing is we have in-store shoppers who are stationed in those stores. They'll shop for your order. They'll place it on the shelf or in the refrigerator, and one of our hybrid uh, delivery team members will come and grab that order and deliver it to your house. So we're taking that sort of to the next level, specializing further, putting the fastest people um, where they do best, and then putting our sort of best, most accurate shoppers with the best customer service experience in the store. So that's, that's sort of what's next for us. Um, I put a question slide here, but I guess questions are till the end. So let's fast forward two slides. <coughs> And this is our uh, $10 off code. So if you want to try Instacart, use this code, QTM10. Just enter it at checkout. And that's going to get you $10 off your first order plus free, de free delivery. And that's all I've got. Awesome. So we, so our New York headquarters is in the Lower East Side. We're in projective space. Okay, and, and then I was curious as to like um, how you're using data to decide whether you know someone should use bike or walk. Uh, my, my curiosity comes from the fact that I worked on a similar logistic operation with laundry. Sure. And we had the same problem. We yeah. Had walk and it's like, yeah. Well, that, that's the story of my life. Right. Yeah, so I think so for us, you know, it's a combination of distance, uh, order size, and speed, or, 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 or deadline, I guess we, we could say. Okay. Um, so we look at those factors, and then we determine, hey, is this too big for someone who's on foot? Um, is it too, uh, you know, too unwieldy for someone who's on a bike? Is it too far for someone who's on a bike or on foot to get there in, in the deadline? 
Um, and then the other question is, hey, if we put it, if we give it to someone who's driving, can they actually park at the location that this order needs to be picked up and deliver it to the customer's home? Awesome. Another question in the back? I have a two-part question. Uh, first of all, I think that you guys look at like non-dormant buildings because a lot of this impression that launch goes through delivery is really only for people who already like, you know, already have the digital like, taken down. So first question is do you deliver to non-dormant dormant buildings? Yeah, absolutely. So we so we actually sort of launched with this idea of, of in-person delivery. Um, so the 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 converse of that is, is an unintended delivery where you could just leave a, a delivery with a doorman or at someone's doorstep. So we actually, in our case, customers are generally at the home when we deliver. So we deliver to walk-ups, we deliver to non-doorman buildings, to homes, to offices. So pretty much anything that has a door, we'll, we'll deliver to. Okay, secondly, what's your defensibility model as far as... Sorry, please. Your defensibility model. Like, I'm sorry myself, it's a whole time here. If I have a possible delivery bag, I have another insulated bag. Sure. So, what's your defensibility model against the fresh and wrecks out there? The heat pods, there's a million of them. Sure. So, just to repeat the question for the microphone the question is competition, like this has been tried before. You yeah. know, I remember when I was 14 years old in Palo Alto, Peapod and Webvan were bringing groceries to me. Both of them burned tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, how do you stave off the competition? Yeah from eating out your margin? Is this just a race to the bottom? Sure. What's your differentiator? Yeah, so I think, so it's on the consumer side, so I talked about some of the things that differentiate us to you, right, as a, as a, as a customer. Um, as far as sort of, you know, defensibility, I think, you know, you saw that slide of, of the, the fridge and the freezer in Whole Foods. We're the only ones who can do that. Um, so you're not gonna see, you know, uh, a Postmates or someone else um, setting up shop next to us. So that's the first thing. And then as far as just sort of the, you know, you talked about a race to the bottom and, and, and the cost of doing this. Well, we don't really have much infrastructure, right? Because we shop from these stores that are brick and mortar stores. We don't own these stores. Um, we don't have warehouses. So we're, we're using this existing infrastructure and our costs are actually relatively low. Great. Any questions for Fly? Jerry, question for Fly? Yes, I actually want to say congratulations to you both. Um, my last startup was actually in the food industry. I know how crazy yes. it is. Awesome, congratulations. Fly? Um, Really cool product. What, I had a question regarding the technology. Yeah. What kind of tech are you using for um, multi-video syncing and uploading to essentially, I'm assuming, a cloud server? <coughs> so the question is, how does the tech that uploads and syncs the work, the video, From work in a nutshell? So condense three years of R and D to thirty seconds. Yeah. Go. <laughs> Well, I mean, basically, there's a server, and when, when you turn multicam on, you start reporting your location back to the server, and at each time you report your location, you're also saying, Are there anybody, is there anybody near my location? Gotcha. So when Aaron and I turned on our multicam, uh, we were, I, I could see Aaron on my phone, he could see me on his, because I have requested anybody near my location, and the server uh, responded that Aaron's near me, and vice versa. Originally, the reason it didn't work is that uh, we have two uh, um, cloud environments, production and staging, right. and I did not say it. Um, then I, you know, I hit uh, invite, and that gets sent to him. Uh, we, there's a lot of sort of published subscription uh, APIs. We have something called PubNode, um, but uh, there are, there's another one called Firebase. Like, there's a few things that allow you to basically push a message from one device to another device. <coughs> When it hits start record, that gets sent to him. Is this via Wi-Fi or? Um, oh, oh yeah, great question. Um, no, you don't need to be on Wi-Fi. Uh, in fact, I wasn't on Wi-Fi. So he was on Wi-Fi and I was on LTE. Okay. They just have to be connected to the internet somehow. So like, if you could load CNN on your, on your Safari, then the, the devices can talk to each other. Cool. Uh, and then when you upload the videos, it's, it's the same stuff. It's just uh, uploading to a server and then the other one downloads it from that server. Very cool. Any more questions right here, Matt? This? It's more of a comment, but I, you probably already know that people who want to enhance their online presence are probably very excited about your app. My husband and his colleagues are all personal trainers. Oh, yeah. They're very entrepreneurial. Yeah. And they always have to demonstrate, like, this is what we're doing, this is how we're playing. Yeah. They decide to come work out with us. And they've used tons of apps. 
similar to yours, and they just said it's disappointing them and crashing. They yeah. tried to put music to it, but then the video stops. I mean, I'm like so excited. When oh, yeah. Please let him know about Fly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's true, like Instagram has all these like workout videos oh, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, and it's true, you can get like, you know, putting some like, you know, pumping music makes like a workout video oh, like yeah. a million times better. Oh, yeah. um, and we have a, uh, like, we have a, a 99.3 like crash free rate. So almost none of our users have ever experienced a single crash. Awesome. Um, so let, let him know about the app and, uh, Please make, uh, make contact with me or Emily so we can be in touch. We, we love to feature users who are making interesting videos online. Uh, we put them out to our, uh, to our own Twitter followers and Instagram followers. Uh, we've got a pretty fast growing um, presence there. And so if he makes any great videos with Fly, we want to know about it. Hashtag made with Fly and, uh, and semi's that to our users. I've got, I've got a follow up with you, Tim, actually. Yeah. I know right now I can still only pick a sort of pre-selected menu of soundtracks to associate to my uh, my video. Can you talk a little bit about if, when, how I'm ever going to be able to pull in anything from my iTunes library and, so, uh, and sync it to my video? Actually, I, I can tell you that you have nothing in your iTunes library because if you did, you would be able to put those. So the, the way Fly works all, is, oh, really? yeah, the way Fly works is you can pick anything you want from your iTunes library. Oh, well, <laughs> that's <laughs> news to me. If your iTunes library is empty, yeah. Then it will uh, supply 10 songs uh, that you can choose from that, that are from friends of ours. By the way, if anybody's a musician and they want to see thousands of people making music videos to their songs, uh, let us know. We can include your songs in our app. Uh, the 10 songs that we include are songs by friends of ours. Uh, and uh, that's what's happening. You have an empty music when, library. When did you add that feature? Because that always that was always there? That was always there. Well, yeah. that's just me being an idiot then. Yeah. Uh, well, no, you just, you just got an iPhone. And, and, I, just, and, and I just had an iPhone. That's the other thing, too. It's not your main device. I so. haven't synced it yet. Yeah. Jolly, we have another question. Well, is 720p static button? Yeah, so it, it does export. Actually, it can even export in 1080p. Uh, depending on the device. So like an iPhone 6 or 5S and above, P 1080p. Uh, the older iPhones will export like, to 720p, or even if it's a 4S, it'll be as low as, uh, as, low as 360p. What's the longest to do? Um, I think five minutes or 10 minutes. So there's not, not much of a time limit. Uh, well, there is if you're trying to do this kind of thing. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's right. at least five minutes. I think we may have recently made it 10 minutes. All right, we got time for one more question. Right there in the red hat. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about pricing. Um, are you happy that you released your app for free? And, and also, why did you? Why is there anything that you can save for in your second app? Uh, oh, oh, great question. So you want to speak a little bit about pricing model, even though business model questions really shouldn't be yeah. allowed, but it's okay. Well, um, it's not New York Tech. You know, we're not going to boo you. So there are <laughs> there are in-app purchases, so it's not like the app is totally free. Uh, and if we had, if we didn't have in-app purchases, we would have gone bankrupt like a, a month and a half ago. Uh, so we do have in-app purchases, and those like sustain us. Uh, so we're not giving it away for free. There are in-app purchases, and uh, and people do buy them. Um, we gave it away for free rather than you know the download is free, but they're in-app purchases. The reason we made the download free is for the multicam thing. So like if let's say I'm super into fly and I want to make a multicam video. And I'm like, hey man, download Fly. We'll make a multicam video together. You know, I don't want him to have to, you know, pay three dollars to download an app just to act as a secondary camera to me. So the way the app works is that it's free to download, and you can act as a secondary camera for multicam for free just to help your friend make a multi-angle video. Um, does that make sense? Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got that there were yeah, uh, downloads. I'm just wondering if you were happy with that decision. And I, I thought you also said that with your second app there were no in-app. That's right, Crop on the Fly, it's, uh, it's a really lightweight app, it just allows you to crop videos. You know, we could make it 99 cents, but uh, you know, our mission at Fly Labs is to create everything for mobile video. So we're creating one mobile video app after another, and part of, part of that is creating really useful tools uh, that people will pay money for, uh, and then part of it is creating tools that are, you know, not quite so substantial, but they're just, they just help people make better iPhone videos. And so the, lo the more people are making iPhone videos, the more people there will be um, th that's the, bi uh, the bigger, sorry, I'm drunk as a skunk. <laughs> the, the bigger market there will be for our uh, more substantial video editing apps. Uh, and it's just like a, a nice thing to do for the iPhone video community. So crop on the fly is a freebie. There's just, uh, there's nothing, there, 
It's free. Awesome. Let's give a hand for all of our demoers. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you.